Hello, my name is Chris Hartley and welcome to a guest lecture for public sector management. That is course POGO 8062 at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. The date is March 1st, 2021. And I'm very pleased to present this lecture on behalf of my colleague, Azad Singh Bali, who has invited me back here to the Australian National University for the second year to give this lecture. Last year at this time, I was in person in Canberra giving this lecture and had a spectacular time interacting with students in the graduate program at the Crawford School. Unfortunately, due to circumstances we're well familiar with, I'm presenting from a distance. I'm in Hong Kong at the current time, and I will provide this lecture uh, by video for you to upload and watch at your convenience. And then we will reconvene later this week for um, a live discussion for you to ask and uh, answer questions and uh, for you also to participate in other ways uh, in an attempt to learn this material. So let me go into a bit of a background about who I am and uh, an overview of this presentation. So I am an assistant professor at the Department of Asian and Policy Studies at the Education University of Hong Kong, where I'm also a program leader in the Bachelor of Social Sciences and Policy Science in Management. I also hold a non-resident fellowship at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and I'm a visiting fellow at the University of Melbourne Connected Cities Lab. I have been studying public management and public policy for a number of years now. Um, your professor, Bali, and I were peers at the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, where we both received our PhD, and uh, we have collaborated on a number of projects and continue to work together very closely. And uh, once again, I extend my appreciation to your excellent professor, Bali, for this invitation. So today, what I'd like to talk about are some very broad themes in the field of public management. And when I say broad themes, I want to emphasize that these are overarching themes that cross time horizons. And in order to gain a better understanding of why we arrived where we are in terms of how we think about government, state society relations and policy making, we really need to understand the historic context in which uh, the modern field has evolved and the way events in the world have influenced how we think about public policy and public management and how scholars and practitioners have crafted certain understandings about public management. Um, so this is a very broad survey. It does not go into very specific detail about mechanics. You have other courses and other lectures in this class to talk about that. So this is a very high level overview and I consider myself very privileged to be able to speak uh, in very general terms about these things because these stories as they evolve are, are actually very interesting. Uh, I believe we can relate to them uh, on a certain level in terms of our own work in organizations, how organizations evolve, how different ideas evolve within those organizations and how we end up with the world that we have today uh, which sometimes seems quite chaotic, but is in fact uh, a product of uh, some very observable forces. So I'm sharing my screen with you. You can see the outline now. I'm going to talk first about uh, the sort of the politics administration dichotomy and how that came about and um, the traditional public administration, which is a manifestation of that. And then I'll talk about new public management as a pushback against that and then post new public management as a pushback once again against new public management. So we see uh, the overarching narrative is kind of like a pendulum swinging back and forth between heavy intervention, heavy government involvement on one hand, and on the other hand, um, a very different approach that de-emphasizes uh, the role and the totalizing nature of governance in general. And then we'll wrap up this lecture uh, with a brief discussion about how we can compare these types of paradigms. Overall, I'm trying to aim for about 45 minutes for this lecture. I may go slightly longer, um, but of course you can control how much of it you watch. You can uh, fast forward and such. So I will be presenting the information that I have for you, and then you can take from it what you will. I encourage you to think about questions you might have, questions of clarification um, about the content or questions of application, how to apply these ideas uh, with what you're doing in your own careers. Um, or just uh, general ideas and observations uh, that occur to you as we move through this lecture. So even though I am speaking to you directly in this lecture format, uh, 
um, I want you to remember that we will actually be speaking virtually face to face very soon. Uh, so I really hope to turn this more into a conversation, into a collaborative session. Uh, and I recall last year learning a lot from speaking with um, people in the class, and I hope to have that opportunity this time as well. So let's jump right in. Um, it's good to begin as early as possible, and we can talk uh, as a kind of an introduction about what we might consider to be ancient public administration. And, and this might be the way public administration has been practiced, or we could think of it as the way public administration has been practiced for hundreds and, and perhaps even thousands of years as we have historical records of the way ancient bureaucracies function, ancient imperial bureaucracies, and uh, other types of bureaucracies uh, for which we have records. And uh, we, we could think of uh, civil service professionalization as a modern phenomenon, but it actually is not. It goes way back to regal bureaucracies uh, and other types of imperial governance structures. Um, we could think of these types of governance systems as, as rather rigid, providing little choice uh, as having a very uh, de determined view of the relationship between citizens and the government um, and a, a rather minimalist view of what the government can do for the citizens. So uh, in, in these ways, government existed to, uh, to perpetuate the functionality of society in general, perhaps the functionality of an economy, uh, perhaps that of uh, an imperial court system or uh, a, a, an overarching governance structure. Um, and then viewing, uh, viewing citizens uh, as, as either those to be um, sort of protected from or protected, um, but uh, not necessarily viewing citizens as, uh, as sources of legitimacy for governance. In other words, not really taking the type of democratic approach that, uh, that we've seen emerge uh, in the last uh, several hundred years and certainly within uh, the last several decades as we talk about uh, post-MPM as well. Um, so if we talk about issues of obedience and, and subservience, uh, even, even surveillance and, and crude forms perhaps, um, and in the transition of power in some cases based on, uh, not necessarily on merit, but on, on favoritism. And thus we could see early signs of the political, if you will, within these types of systems. Um, that is, if we take a very broad definition of uh, what is political. Um, it's political in the sense uh, that there were interests fighting for control over resources and power um, in many cases, uh, but uh, not necessarily political in the way we think of it in terms of uh, the machinations of uh, politics in a democratic system or in a representative system. If we go ahead to um, sort of the, the, the politics uh, and, and administration divide, uh, it really becomes quite an interesting observation then um, to look at how this has evolved. So this notion of uh, sort of ancient public administration uh, and how it certainly began to turn the corner to become modernized in very early ways, certainly the way we, uh, and the way scholars and practitioners thought about public administration, say in, in the 1800s, for example, and a lot of the early research and early writing about public administration, including Max Weber, uh, whom you see uh, pictured here in this slide. Um, Basically, if we were to boil it down to several simple ideas, we could talk about the idea, um, the emerging idea that the state as a provider of services should function independently of uh, political influence. And that is uh, the notion that the state should, should treat citizens fairly in a general sense or treat at least the citizens fairly that it's all appropriate to treat fairly. Um, and, and that there should be certain standards of professionalism. Um, so to avoid this kind of predatory capture of the state by elites, um, there were training systems and systems to um, uh, evaluate the skills of public servants through imperial examinations or other types of mo uh, other modern iterations, uh, uh, civil service examinations, etc. And uh, we could talk about this kind of cleavage as leading to uh, the early, one of the early ways that we have branched into the study of public administration as separated from the study of politics. And in fact, when you go to uh, many universities around the world, you will often find uh, vestiges of that divide today. Uh, there are public policy and public administration um, departments and public management departments and schools uh, that exist separately from political science. 
so the two fields have um, gone their own ways. And, uh, and yet um, we see uh, both of them often speaking about similar things using different terminology. But back to this sort of origins of uh, how we got here. Um, we could look at this a variety of different ways, but I like to look at the epistemics of, of public policy. That is, how do we know what we know? How do we uh, develop knowledge uh, that can be used in the policy process? And this is something that I enjoy looking at in my own research, uh, which I talk about uh, power and knowledge in the policy process and the sort of the political perceptions of that knowledge uh, as, as a way to legitimize uh, the policies that ultimately emerge from it. Um, so when we look at the politics administration divide, we can talk about a variety of issues, including how truth and facts and evidence are, are constructed in social environments, uh, in culturally unique environments in some cases, um, that no construction of truth necessarily emerges uh, pure and independent from its context. Uh, so this is what we might call a more constructivist or interpretivist approach. Uh, which is one that I and many other colleagues and, and scholars take. Um, that is very, a decidedly political way of looking at bureaucracy and public administration. And yet at the same time, there's a very long and deep history of looking at public administration in a, as a very technocratic process. It's a process that's purely focused on uh, gathering the evidence, gathering the data, analyzing it, and making the most rational, sensible, efficient decision um, as a way to um, uh, sort of curate public services and public resources as, as responsibly uh, and effectively as possible. Um, so we see this kind of idealized view of what governments do, but I think we can all relate to the fact that we've seen considerable amount of political pushback um, to this even uh, in the past several years in various populist movements that have sought to undermine uh, the credibility um, of governments, of public policymakers, and to undermine the credibility of, of the facts and of the science and of the evidence that goes into that. So I think uh, I, I'm very interested in this topic because it's, a, it's an evolving topic. It gets to some very interesting philosophical questions. Uh, and uh, perhaps it's something that we can relate to uh, in our own uh, careers as well. Um, here's an example of this. This was an example I used last year. So uh, it would have been considered very current last year, but I think it's still a very telling example to use this year. You might remember when this happened. Um, this was uh, this is a map of a projection of a hurricane, uh, which is a, a type what we call a typhoon in um, North America. And um, the scientists, the uh, scientists at the uh, Weather Bureau, predicted the hurricane's path, predicted the timing, and of course, there's there's kind of a, a cone there. Uh, in, in which uh, the hurricane could sort of go anywhere within that cone. There's a little bit of uncertainty. Um, and of course, as you get further out uh, from the current time, the uncertainty, uh, the, the, the broadness of the cone reflects the increasing uncertainty. That's just sort of like a confidence interval. And uh, Donald Trump, who is pictured here showing this map, had uh, tweeted uh, apparently um, before or, or after this projection was made that Alabama was, which is represented here, the state that says AL, was represented as, uh, he argued that Alabama was in the line of fire for this hurricane, that the people in Alabama should be concerned about the hurricane. Well, the, um, uh, the meteorologists um, were not projecting that Alabama would be severely affected. So, um, so Trump, rather than uh, walk back his statement, which is uh, sort of walking back anything, is not necessarily something that uh, he was well known for, uh, instead um, took, this is why we call it Sharpie gate, he took a Sharpie, which is a black pen, and he just drew this, uh, this extra little bubble that tries to capture the, uh, the southeast corner of Alabama as a way to try to prove that he was right. Well, you know, the little details of this are almost just uh, e even too silly uh, to mention, uh, as so many things were during uh, that presidency, but at the same time, uh, we have to consider that this does raise very interesting questions we can ask um, about the tension between politics and facts or politics and science and, um, and, and thus the science that underlies public policymaking. So if there's a strategy to undermine the credibility of policymakers, is it to undermine their policymaking process? Is it to undermine the implementation or the evaluation? Or is it uh, now acceptable to undermine the very facts 
that uh, on which uh, policymakers are basing their decisions. So, uh, if, for example, uh, the science. So I could have shown you numerous other examples of this, but it was a, a phenomenon that played out in the previous uh, U.S. presidential administration, and to some degree, uh, playing out uh, around the world as well in other ways, particularly now with the COVID crisis, which is uh, requires policymaking uh, that is so uh, closely linked with evidence and data and facts. And yet uh, we continue to see political forces in some countries um, that uh, they want to minimize uh, the severity of it for either political or economic or other types of reasons. So I don't think that the politicization of fact is gonna go anywhere, but it does illustrate the politics administration divide that which we see even today. So when we talk about that divide and we talk about traditional public administration, which is really what we think about on the bureaucratic side of it, um, we, we talk about certain standardization processes. So if we remove the politics and we focus purely on public organizations as um, the, purely the functional aspects of public organizations, how can we make them more efficient, more effective, et cetera, um, then we get into discussions uh, that are not too dissimilar from business management. Um, how do we balance the books? How do we conduct our uh, human resource um, operations? How do we uh, conduct organizational strategy making, et cetera? And, and how do we institutionalize certain practices so that as, uh, as positions get handed from one person to another, we have some continuity in how the organization functions strategically and operationally. So you know, we have ideas of protocols, procedures, guidelines, we have rule of law, we have a very standardized processes, and uh, we have this sort of desire for uh, stability. Um, you might have noticed my little photos here. I was a big Simpsons fan, and uh, one of the great uh, stereotypes of the uh, bureaucrat was expressed in The Simpsons through Patty and Selma, who are uh, Marge's sisters. And um, the recurring joke in The Simpsons across its many, many decades, it's been going now, still going uh, since 1989, um, and DMV is the Department of Motor Vehicles. One of the stereotypes is that they are um, sort of mindless bureaucrats who are not responsive, uh, are not democratically accountable or responsive to customers, but they just go and then they just do their jobs in a, in a kind of a rote, uh, mindless way. Um, they take a lot of breaks. They don't really care how long people are waiting, et cetera. And this I will get to later in the lecture is kind of a negative stereotype that uh, developed about bureaucracy and public service, uh, especially in an age during the 1980s and 90s when uh, there was a lot of pushback against big government and bureaucratization of uh, public services. So we'll get to that as a, as a recurring theme. So when we look at the tenets of, of traditional public administration, um, we, we can talk about the way public organizations think about solving problems. And uh, when we talk about the very practical rationalist or what we would call Taylorist uh, view of solving problems, and that is that um, the, the, the charge of the bureaucrat is not necessarily to be bureaucratically accountable necessarily, or to be democratically accountable, but to uh, optimize the function within the organization. So uh, to measure the problem, uh, to manage what you can measure, uh, and to find practical, workable solutions, which of course is, uh, is quite an alluring idea. Um, how could we argue against government uh, wanting to try to be as, uh, as effective as possible and at the same time being as efficient as possible? Um, so we talk about the idea that uh, we want to emphasize good uh, practice in uh, strategizing, good practice in policy making and understanding uh, problems, but also in a very hierarchical type of way, which if you look back to the early 20th century, um, as uh, we saw private sector adopting very hierarchical practice, particularly in the uh, in, in the industrialization age and early examples of mass production, uh, taking very hierarchical approaches to management, very top down. And we see in many cases, uh, government responding and, and mimicking that in a sort of way as well. 
uh, where we had large bureaucratic organizations. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, those developed and uh, what was the purpose behind uh, approaching governance in that very top-down way. Uh, so Max Faber here uh, provides uh, so uh, kind of a list, laundry list of what we might think of as tenants, uh, core concepts of uh, what a public manager would be in this type of, of governance. And Max Faber was one of the, uh, the original thinkers on this topic, or at least one that's, that's most commonly cited. Um, and uh, we won't go through each one of these, but, but I think as you read through these, uh, what you might be able to relate to yourself uh, as a public servant, what reminds you of how your own organization behaves, and, and to think about how interesting and amazing it is that uh, literally 100 years, an exact century uh, after uh, this work of uh, Max Faber was published uh, by the University of California Press, that we can see vestiges of these ideas showing up uh, even in our day-to-day -day lives as public service uh, servants and public managers. Um, so you know, bureaucrats is personally free and subject to authority only within a defined area. So we have sort of this bounded level of, of autonomy uh, organized in a clearly defined hierarchy, uh, as we had just mentioned, a defined sphere of competence. So uh, we might outline the types of duties that we expect uh, an, off an office holder to have, and we might train that office holder to, uh, to fulfill those duties, or we might select the person who appears best capable of fulfilling them. Um, free contractual relationships, so offices are filled fairly. Um, uh, the contractual relationship protects both parties from malfeasance. Candidates are selected on the basis of technical qualifications, as I mentioned. Uh, fixed salaries, um, which is uh, an interesting idea rather than uh, simply sort of arbitrary or under the table. Uh, types of arrangements, informal arrangements. Um, office treated as a sole occupation of the incumbent, so you don't do anything else. You treat it as a career. You treat it, you commit yourself to it. Um, there's a separation between ownership and management. Um, this is sort, sort of, it gets into kind of principal agent theory uh, as well, the idea that uh, the, the public servant is a, is a steward of the institution. Uh, the, who exists to protect the integrity of the institution um, on behalf of the owners of the institution. And of course, in a, in a public management setting, the owners would be uh, the public. And uh, we would look at that as sort of the democratic control or the democratic accountability mechanism that we place on public organizations. Uh, and then, of course, officials are subject to discipline and control. This is a largely a function of what happens within organizations in terms of um, trying to reduce malfeasance or corruption, et cetera. How do you manage, measure that? How do you develop a culture uh, of compliance uh, rather than one uh, of, of subversion uh, or obfuscation? Uh, so what's interesting about traditional public administration is not necessarily that in that era, people said, well, we need to do uh, traditional public administration. We need to look at the traditional public administration textbook or guidebook and we're gonna go by all these practices. This is really a, a story uh, and an illustration in how norms and practices evolve out of certain conditions and, and how they converge uh, to become uh, very similar across contexts, the way uh, New York City and Chicago may structure uh, their governance, uh, their urban governance, for example, or the way certain states might, or the way certain countries might. Um, so, so the more uh, contextually different the, uh, the various actors are, of course, the more difficult it is going to be to transfer uh, those policies. The diffusion of policies is not going to be quite as smooth. Um, but what's interesting about traditional public administration is we can look at it kind of as a philosophy in a way. Uh, and it does touch on a lot of other philosophical elements that were being developed at that time, both in academia and in practice. Um, if you were to ask yourself what kinds of ideals and values would that propose, I think that would be a fair question and a very interesting one uh, to answer. Um, remember now that traditional public administration is a reaction to the kind of uh, very sort of brutal, uh, top-down, unaccountable, um, and very centralized or hierarchical administration. It, it continued some of those practices, but it also sought to actually uh, perform well and 
what it, what might be the goal of them? The goal of that might be fairness and equity, that um, all citizens are, are treated equally and fairly uh, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the bureaucracy, and uh, in terms of uh, what their responsibilities are and what uh, the government's uh, responsibilities are to them. Clearly, efficiency is an aspect of that, uh, using the public purse or public funds to fund things. There is always a, a political pressure um, to be able to perform efficiently. And of course, we, we see that come to a head in the, in the 80s, uh, we'll talk about with new public management uh, and reactions to it. Effectiveness would be how well uh, is, is the public organization delivering its services on time, um, high quality, et cetera, or as we see more recently, able to be measured in various ways and compared. Uh, as we see the proliferation of indices about good governance and the variety of ways we have of measuring good governance, which is not just necessarily at the national level, but we can also apply some of these principles and measurements uh, to individual public organizations, agencies, ministries, uh, and even local and regional government bodies as well. Um, and then it's rational and, te and technocratic. So the idea that uh, it is um, there is a, a truth to know. There's a truth to understand about what a policy problem is or what a policy issue is. And the goal is to understand that as thoroughly as possible so that we can use public resources to try to remedy whatever, uh, whatever those problems are. Um, that automatically creates a, a power distance, not just in terms of the governed and the governors, um, but also in terms of who holds knowledge in, in the process. Um, and uh, this is where we get into the idea uh, about sort of elite knowledge, uh, the, the, the knowledge power nexus, uh, the idea that um, the knowledge that is created for public policy, whether it's scientific knowledge or evidence or data, um, is something that is crucial for delivering uh, on the effectiveness and efficiency and fairness of traditional public administration. Um, so we then ask ourselves, what does this mean? Uh, why, why does this matter? How does this shape how we view state society relations? How all of us relate to our government? Um, trust and legitimacy is a big issue and there's a huge literature on trust. And uh, it's obviously an, an, an issue that continues to be discussed even today. Um, you can open up the New York Times or the Atlantic or the Age or Sydney Morning Herald and we can find something there in uh, coverage of politics or government uh, related to trust and legitimacy. And, uh, and the crisis, quote, the crisis of trust, uh, that is declining levels of trust in governments and in institutions and even in, uh, within society among each other, among ourselves, uh, is something that has been observed empirically uh, for many decades now. Um, so uh, are we more likely to trust a, a traditional public administration style government that appears to uh, be very focused on the technocratic aspects of governing? Um, what about uh, the implications for leadership and human resources? What kind of leaders might excel in a traditional public administration type of environment? Are they the type of leaders who are entrepreneurial, creative, groundbreaking, or are they the types of leaders who uh, know their place in a hierarchy, who uh, don't step beyond uh, the boundaries of their own office? Uh, and, and then as a corollary question to that, um, can we expect government to be creative, innovative, et cetera, in settings like that? So again, there's a, there's a lot of literature and a lot of people talking about government innovation, social innovation, how can the government be involved in these types of things, government entrepreneurship, policy entrepreneurship. So these are all uh, kind of concepts that revisit what we think of as good leadership in public sector, including um, in, in more traditional style. Uh, uh, organizations or organizations that, that adopt this style. Um, and then of course, accountability to stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders of a public organization? Obviously, um, you know, they would be the public at the end of the day. Uh, and how can we demonstrate uh, our accountability? Uh, there's, you could argue there's no accountability without measurement. There's no accountability without transparency. So what does that mean operationally on the ground? Transparency and measurement. Uh, mean uh, access to information, access to how uh, people are hired and fired, access to budget uh, items, access to how procurement occurs, 
access to how decisions are made, et cetera. Um, so uh, we have interesting new ways to uh, observe phenomena and to communicate them to the general public based on the technologies that we have. Um, does this additional transparency or sunshine, if you will, um, actually generate uh, more accountability, more trust and better state society relations? I think it's a fair question. Um, looking a little bit at the historic development of this, um, by the 1940s, traditional public administration or you know, the ways that it was practiced, even if it wasn't called that, it was certainly nothing new. Um, but coming out of the Depression era, there were substantial fiscal constraints, and then there was a shock event. So the fiscal constraints on traditional public administration sort of placed a lot of stress on um, governments that, that might have um, sort of uh, become quite large in their budgets. Um, the shock event of World War II then gave, uh, gave a lot of uh, governments an excuse to mobilize resources. Uh, an imperative to mobilize resources to respond to the war effort. Uh, and then of course there was the post-war rebuilding which required its own mobilization of resources, money, people and capacity uh, for the rebuilding effort, um, and Marshall Plan, et cetera. And the substantial amount of capital flows going into uh, this effort required uh, some level of coordination and administrative capacity. And this is not only at the national government level, um, but also uh, at the global coordination. And uh, this is where we saw the emergence of, of ultimately in, in their formative state, the emergence of organizations like OECD and others that were uh, intended to try to uh, organize how these resources were marshaled to help um, uh, countries rebuild their infrastructure and get back on the uh, the right track, so to speak, uh, towards economic development, et cetera. Um, so the idea that uh, a, a good government was one that could mobilize quickly, organize, coordinate, et cetera, and that these were urgent mandates uh, following uh, the Second World War um, necessarily fit pretty well with the philosophy of traditional public administration, very top down, very organized, uh, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and thus we have the administrative state uh, at its, uh, almost at its apex. And um, of course we could talk all day about uh, comparative uh, public administration, different paradigms uh, as they were manifest across different countries. In Asia, there was a particular type of developmental state uh, that emerged uh, after the second world war uh, that was observed by the, and adopted by the four Asian tigers and led to undeniably high levels of economic growth and, and success in certain ways. And, uh, and thus a lot of this uh, type of growth was credited towards the coordination capacity uh, of, of the very top down and what we call developmentalist style government, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, et cetera, and, and Japan. And much has been written, uh, including by Chalmers Johnson. I would recommend his work uh, on Japan um, in talking about uh, the use of uh, government agencies to try to direct and steer economic development in the post-war era. Um, in the West, if we look at the, uh, the United States, um, there was a huge surge of um, uh, sort of individuals returning from the war. Um, the wartime economy had to re be reconfigured and reoriented towards a peacetime economy, which means you make different things. Um, so it, instead of uh, necessarily guns and machinery, machinery for wartime, uh, although much of that did continue, um, it, the, the demand for, uh, for cars and the demand for appliances and the demand for other types of things was going to go up. Uh, this created jobs and they created an economic boom, uh, which was uh, substantial throughout um, you know, the 50s and the 60s. And throughout that time, uh, the economy was roaring. Uh, it was a generation uh, that had um, seen a, a lot of good innovation also uh, in, in development and created a lot of tax receipts for governments and governments grew and government was in the United States at its, uh, at its highest and its apex in that time. Huge infrastructure projects, the Eisenhower Interstate System, which was the series of, of highways that connected um, cities in the United States, uh, which we enjoy today. Um, in various states of repair, uh, some good and some not. 
depending on which states choose to fund them or, or how well the government chooses to fund, the, the federal government chooses to fund it. Um, we saw the investment in education uh, and uh, the growth of public universities uh, to not only educate people returning from the war, but also their children, uh, also to contribute to the, um, uh, the primacy of the United States or what they thought was the primacy of the United States in research and development, particularly in the context of the Cold War, et cetera, to try to be out in front on innovation and product development. Um, we saw large government programs like the Great Society under Lyndon B. Johnson uh, that sought to attack uh, poverty through a variety of different ways. Uh, one example being electrification and electric infrastructure uh, in, in the southeastern United States. R&D and technology, as I'd mentioned, a lot of it's still going into wartime efforts. Well, not wartime efforts, but efforts related to the military. Uh, so a lot of what we enjoy today in terms of our technology um, came from efforts to try to innovate and uh, be ahead technologically at times um, that uh, the United States saw they needed to maintain good military uh, stead. So this is one of the uh, slides that's my favorite. I must credit this uh, slide to Dr. Leslie Powell, who is the founding dean of the College of Public Policy at the Hamid bin, uh, Hamid bin Khalifa University in Doha, Qatar. And um, so, so thank you, uh, Dr. Powell, uh, for uh, making this slide. Uh, it is a fantastic overview of uh, how we connect general trends in history with general ideas in public policy and administration. No theory in, in really pretty much any setting in, in the social sciences or, or in, in, in the professional sciences uh, emerges in a vacuum. Uh, scholars and thinkers are people who inhabit the real world and they are influenced by the things they see. They're influenced by the things they hear. Um, I'm influenced by the things I hear coming from the United States uh, political environment or from the way a COVID-19 response is discussed or from the political environment in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, I hear about these things and it makes me curious and interesting about something and it makes me wanna test and push on, on theories. And, and this is no different. And um, I won't go into too much detail, but a lot of these, uh, these historic events, I have already discussed post-war reconstruction, the Cold War, the need that, that, that for the U.S. to uh, maintain or enhance its primacy and in technological innovation um, were two drivers um, that uh, really had a lot to do with uh, government intervention. We had the era of foreign direct investment, if we want to look at development economics, uh, the emergence of, of international development aid, and the organizations uh, like the World Bank that uh, were charged with trying to um, generate economic growth in, in uh, lesser developed countries uh, in order to uh, try to create kind of a global environment for the flow of goods and capital and global markets, um, but also to try to perhaps create a sense of uh, stability um, in, in a way to try to avoid uh, the, this, this great catastrophe, which was on many people's minds early in the 50s, which was how do we prevent another one of these catastrophic world wars. Then we had some shocks to uh, the fiscal situation of many governments when we saw the oil crisis in the 70s. And the oil crisis in the 70s kind of really forced people to rethink what this big government model kind of was, because prior to that, it was, it was steaming along quite well, quite effectively. You had poverty alleviation programs, you had great funding for public education, you had infrastructure funding, etc. Well, the oil crises uh, then severely cramped the economy for a while, uh, cut down on government tax receipts and thus uh, destabilized the fiscal um, stability of, of a lot of governments. And uh, thus the question then began, well, how can we cut back? How can government cut back? Is, has government gotten too big? So this is where we see kind of some of the idea, a logical, uh, the ideological pushback against um, these old styles of government. And this is where we begin to see the emergence of new public management and some of its corollary theories, new institutional economics, et cetera, then if we come a, a little bit more recently, we see the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was uh, interpreted by many people as kind of the victory of a, of a type of Western, uh, politically liberal and pro-market type of, of paradigm. Pardon me while I uh, plug in my computer so it does not run out of batteries. There we are. 
Uh, and then transition paradigms, which were how to uh, get post-Soviet states to uh, transition uh, economically from centrally planned systems into market systems. How do you get them to transition from um, you know, one party state or totalitarianism into competitive democratic systems uh, and so forth. Um, then we had um, 2008 financial crisis, which had its own uh, impacts on government. And then of course we could talk, uh, what we don't see here uh, is a very, very transformational events that we're going through right now. And I think it's fair to question and would ask you what you think uh, some of the longer term effects of COVID-19 are gonna be a global pandemic that many public health experts had um, had long been warning about, um, but but nobody really wanted to try to prepare for. Or, well, it wasn't necessarily very popular to constantly worry about that. It seems so far off, so unlikely. Uh, we'll worry about it if it happens. Kind of attitude. Uh, well, it did, and we really got to test uh, you know what our response capacities were, and in a in a spectacularly interesting kind of comparative context. Uh, whose policies work better and whose didn't. Uh, so it's the outcomes obviously are to be determined, but um, it, it's another one of these bubbles that would certainly be placed on a, on a graph like this. So you're living through history, uh, pay attention to it and get involved and get passionate about it. That would be my uh, recommendation. So as I told you, now we're gonna transition to new public management. So there was a traditional public administration, um, government, um, a big government doing a lot of things um, in terms of um, trying to improve society in its manifold ways. Um, but then uh, the ideological pushback being this has gone too far. It encapsulated in um, Ronald Reagan's quote, Ronald Reagan, president of the US from 80 to 88, who said the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Now this is all part and parcel to a type of ideology and a political narrative that sought to undermine the, the credibility uh, of government to say that the government had gotten bloated, too big, too inefficient, too unresponsive. And the solution to this was not more government. The solution to this was less government. Um, but um, to get to that, to, to make that logical leap connect, there had to be a lot in between. There had to be a lot of, uh, of connection in terms of what fills the gap, in terms of what, what do we focus on, uh, in a new type of uh, understanding of what government and what the role of government is. Um, here we have Margaret Thatcher, who was uh, very much aligned with Ronald Reagan and how she interpreted public sector reforms and, and the uh, inefficiency of government. Um, pay attention to this quote here. There are individual men and there are families and no government can do anything except through people. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher is famous for saying there's no such thing as society. So we'll see, and, and what she means by that, we'll see in a moment. But the idea uh, that we focus more on individuals rather than on government organizations, and we kind of reduce um, uh, the, uh, the sort of the element of society down to the individual and the decisions of the individual and the role of the individual and, and it's what, what you might consider to be a very individualist or, or frontiersman uh, type of approach um, to governance that uh, commanded a lot of attention and still influences our governance today. So what are the basics? Smaller government works best. Um, trust in the market more than in government. So uh, the decisions people make in a market setting are more, um, you know, more valid, are more informed by information, are more creative are better oriented towards solutions to problems than are the decisions made in these, these big, inefficient, unresponsive government agencies where people are just trying to keep their jobs like Patty and Selma. Um, all types of actors, including the private sector can be involved in public sector provision or the provision of what we previously thought were uh, services only provided by the government. Um, how do we illustrate that government is not functioning through performance indicators? So as I said before, in terms of accountability, um, you know, there, ha there have to be ways to observe how government is functioning and to measure it, uh, particularly its efficiency or inefficiency as the case may be. So uh, in this way, uh, you can demonstrate that government has wasted X amount of dollars but not produced uh, some good or service or, or not been responsive or produced an outcome. For example, we spend all of this money on education and yet we have all this illiteracy. We spend all this money on infrastructure and yet we have all of these people without electricity. We spend all of this money 
on uh, policing and yet we have a crime problem. Whatever the case might be, it really began to be focused on how well is government performing and it was legitimate to question government's uh, performance and to say, uh, are there other models um, by which we can provide public services? Um, so private, that leads us, of course, to privatization. That's the idea that the private sector can provide uh, things more efficiently, uh, more entrepreneurially, more creatively, that is. Um, and that um, we would want to reserve the role of the state to very minimal functions, and that is to regulate the functionality of the market, um, you know, the, the rules of the game to, to observe that people are playing the game correctly, um, but not necessarily to actually be in the game as a, as a provider of goods or services. Um, so, so Kettle's 2005 argument gives a nice overview of this. Um, core components of productivity, which is basically being efficient, marketization, that is to make markets, market making, to create markets, uh, and competition uh, so that the government is not the sole provider of a particular service, but that uh, the government is one among multiple providers of a public service. And if a private sector company does it better, then government will, uh, will be marginalized and, and will not be uh, selected for that kind of provision. Service orientation. So we've got, we've got customers, not citizens. We'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, decentralization, which is a, a, a very big and powerful idea that continues to go on today. Policy coordination and strategy, which is about um, uh, making sure that the minimal role of the government is uh, actually targeted, laser focused on only on the things that um, people deem government should do, or, or these reformers deem government should do, and not on anything additional. And then of course, accountability as well. If, uh, that may be democratic accountability, it may be accountability uh, in, in terms of hiring and firing within public organizations. The Once again, the stereotype of the lazy bureaucrat or the ineffective bureaucrat, Patty and Selma out behind the Department of Motor Vehicles taking a 30 minute smoke break while people line up for their driver's license, uh, will fire them, right? They're, they're not working hard, they're not efficient. Uh, they're part of the problem. Um, so it's, uh, the idea was compelling uh, and, it, and it certainly in many ways was that uh, people observed that government just kind of got too big for its riches. It kind of got um, sort of uh, too uh, overfed itself on tax revenues and kept growing. And, and something ultimately had to be done. The pendulum had to swing back. So we have some interesting quotes here from Kettle. Since the 80s, a remarkable movement to reform public management has swept the globe. So this is um, really underscoring the fact that this just did not happen only in a certain number of countries, but ultimately became quite a popular uh, reform paradigm. Um, <clears throat> the early countries um, were in the mid 80s, uh, mid to late 80s in the UK, the U.S. in certain parts, and in uh, New Zealand was, was out in front, and, and I believe Australia was also uh, in some ways out in front on that as well. But then, of course, as these moderately powerful countries um, with a moderate degree of uh, power and influence over narratives uh, began to influence how other countries would adopt their own reforms. Uh, they did this either directly or through their influence in uh, global organizations uh, like the World Bank, IMF, et cetera, um, to say, well, there is a standard for good governance and, uh, and you need to uh, reform according to the tenets of good governance. And, uh, and if you do so, then um, well, we, we will extend aid or, or help in some, some types of ways. Um, so again, it's a value for money approach uh, that has been very, uh, very influential. We could look at the theories, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but if you're curious, uh, you could look at the, the work of the Virginia School and public choice theory. Um, <clears throat> that is the idea that we really can look at um, the individual. We get back, like Margaret Thatcher said, there are only individuals. Well, if it's only individuals comprising society, we don't even really need to worry about analyzing or optimizing society uh, at a higher level, let's look at individuals. Let's look at how they make decisions. So we get the emergence or the application of, of decision theory or game theory. We get rational choice theory, et cetera. Uh, and if we can understand uh, the, the rational choices of individuals and simply scale that up, uh, we can understand uh, perhaps how uh, institutions can, can uh, bound their behavior and then how uh, organizations reflect this kind of behavior as well. Um, 
uh, Niskanen's work on budget maxim maximization as well, um, that uh, again, focused on individuals, that uh, individual bureaucrats, um, are they there to serve? Uh, what, what is their motivation? What's the public service motivation? Are they there to maximize their own personal influence and their own uh, uh, career pathways, et cetera? Are they there to maximize the influence of the organization that they work for? Um, and are these things at odds with the principles of efficiency, effectiveness, accountability, uh, et cetera? So these were some of the underlying, and calculus of consent is the name of the work that Buchanan and Tula uh, proposed. Um, this is, uh, these were, were very powerful and continue to be used uh, as arguments against uh, this sort of bugbear of big government, you know, and, and typically we see the debates about big government falling along political lines. I think you can probably relate to that in Australia. We can certainly relate to that in the United States and, and many other countries uh, as well. <clears throat> An example of this that we, we heard often about in the United States was the proverbial bridge to nowhere. I mean, what could be a better expression of government inefficiency than a $223 million bridge uh, that serves uh, free houses or something like that. So this was a, a budget appropriation uh, that was made uh, earmarked, um, <clears throat> actually 450 million to produce some bridges. Now, how did this come about? Was there an economic analysis done on this? Was it, is, are these bridges going to earn back their, uh, their, um, their cost? Well, and their cost of capital? Um, likely not, perhaps. Um, were there other reasons to do it? Were there political reasons to do it? Perhaps. Um, was it the consequence of a political system? That is political influence, uh, political log rolling, uh, what we call um, uh, pork barrel spending, et cetera. Uh, well, uh, could well be that. So examples like this are trotted out to say, look, proof that uh, government doesn't work for you, government works for certain political interests, it is wasteful, uh, and thus uh, it needs to be uh, substantially uh, reformed. Now, when we talk about the role of the individual, um, we then are directing our attention to what we would consider the public and public not necessarily as a collective whole, but as, as, uh, as a variety of different things. It could be the pluralist perspective. It could be the public as a consumer, uh, <clears throat> which is that uh, government views the public as a, uh, as a customer to, uh, to serve. Uh, the public uh, as represented, uh, so in a representative context, uh, the public as a client, which is similar to the public as a consumer, and then of course the public as a citizen. So the public as a citizen is very interesting because it departs from the idea of, of individuals as clients or individuals as consumers because the word citizen implies not only that you get something back from your government, but that you have a responsibility as well. So, um, and, that, and that responsibility doesn't end with paying taxes, right? That responsibility might include softer aspects. That responsibility might include um, you know, being a good community citizen uh, in, in whatever ways that you might define that. So, um, of course, I just can't resist to drop in a few Simpsons pictures as well. Um, the Simpsons often has biting commentary on the way government works. This is uh, an example at a, uh, at a public hearing and, and uh, you know, you see the cross section of the population, a, a diverse population, young, old, multi-ethnic, et cetera, and, uh, and, you know, trying to agree on something. And yet we see on this side, you know, kind of the populist idea of a public, uh, angry, pushing back, we, we're not going to take it anymore kind of thing, the, the old pitchforks and torches. Uh, what do we see more of in the world today? Well, I'll let you make your decision on that, but uh, I think uh, we have seen uh, probably a little bit more of the right in certain contexts, certainly in the United States, we have literally seen torches uh, in the past several years, Houston rallies, so um, really quite interesting and quite prescient. Um, so the, it's a legitimate question uh, to, to ask how do you consider yourself? Do you think of yourself as a citizen? Do you think of yourself as a customer of the government? You pay, you get something back. It's very transactional. Um, and, uh, and it reduces your role uh, to uh, no more than uh, somebody who walks into a grocery store and buys an apple. Um, okay, but is the relationship between the citizen and the government more sublime than that? Is it more, is there more implied um, <clears throat> than simply what we could reduce to as, as a, uh, as a relationship between customers and providers. <clears throat> stakeholder is a little bit more complicated and we could think of ourselves as stakeholders as uh, you know, shareholders might think or as stakeholders, um, people who have interests uh, in what the government does. Uh, so uh, this implies that the government is responsible to serve 
the interests of a particular group or a particular stakeholder group or multiple ones, et cetera. Um, taxpayers, another one, you hear that one all, you know, well, the taxpayers of uh, Texas deserve better. Uh, well, this is not a class on political communication, but this is certainly where those two fields dovetail. Um, I believe that uh, there's a significant power in the way we craft language. And uh, otherwise we wouldn't have an entire and very, uh, very active and interesting field of research uh, addressing these things. Um, so it's, it's a quite a, a clever use of, of a term, taxpayer, who, which basically um, takes uh, the role of the citizen, uh, the, the two dimensions of that, and focuses only on one. It reduces, once again, the citizen to a very transactional role. It says, what do I get back from the government? Well, you know, not, not to be too cliche, but we could, we could revert back to uh, John F. Kennedy's quote, you know, ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country, right? That is a, a notion of citizenship that might be broader, that might say uh, responsibilities are a two-way street. Uh, but the reduction of looking at uh, state society relations as uh, only focused on an individual, individual taxpayers, individual uh, people, individual consumers, uh, really removes a lot of that collective responsibility. And, and some people would say it kind of gives a little bit of, um, uh, it undermines the sense of community in a certain way. Uh, so uh, I'll leave you to, uh, to your own opinions about that, but it's certainly something I think you could think about. So in uh, moving towards comparing traditional public administration, new public management, we could talk about how uh, each of them uh, serves the public. We could ask interesting questions uh, in which one of these two might you be able to say legitimacy, public or political legitimacy could be uh, easier to gain. Uh, and then we could talk about the differences between output and process legitimacy. If you haven't uh, considered that, uh, consider output legitimacy being, um, or even maybe outcome legitimacy. Uh, if the government delivers something, uh, it is legitimate. So uh, an example might be China. Um, there is a lot of uh, output legitimacy, uh, or, or at least the, uh, the, the Communist Party of China relies on output legitimacy as a way to maintain the perception of its greatness. And that would be, we've delivered more than 7% uh, yearly GDP growth for the last 40 years. What more do you want from us, right? Uh, we, we're giving you wealth. We're giving you opportunity. Uh, shouldn't you be happy, right? Shouldn't that be enough? That, that might be an example of output legitimacy. Process legitimacy would be, um, well, you know, whatever the government does, whatever it produces, I want to be part of it, right? I want to be heard. I want my concerns to be heard. I want the process of uh, making decisions to be uh, participatory, collaborative, democratic, et cetera, um, because I feel that I will believe in a policy that, that reflects my values. Uh, so this process legitimacy might be something that we look at more sort of in democratic uh, systems. Um, or our democratic systems, a combination of both of those things where it really gets complicated. So uh, I won't go through each one of these, but uh, you can compare uh, how we would look at uh, serving the public from a, from a traditional public administration viewpoint, very top down, um, and, uh, uh, and, and ring fencing the politics versus the bureaucracy. The new public management view would be uh, think of the public as as a customer um, and deliver the goods to the to the customer in the cheapest, uh, most efficient way possible, even if that means uh, looking outside of the government for uh, service and goods providers in the private sector. Um, and uh, in this way, we see uh, some innovations related to that. Here are a few examples, courtesy once again of, of Dr. Leslie Powell. Um, at the uh, Ahmad bin Khalifa University in Qatar, um, talking about some uh, examples of how we might see these types of uh, ideals show up in government documents. It's one thing to talk about them uh, in a PowerPoint slide. It's one thing to talk about them as, uh, as an expression of, of um, theoretical concepts. Um, but words mean things. And I would think, and I always tell my own students that um, we have certain ideas about how government functions based before we come to class, before we even enter our, our degree program, based on our own curiosities, what we could read in the newspaper, what our friends talk about, what our parents talk about, or what our family talks about at the dinner table, as uncomfortable as it might be if it's politics. Um, you know, so 
what our education and what a course should help you to do is, is to uh, help you think differently about this, uh, to uh, have the theories and the language to describe uh, what is going on uh, in a complex situation that you might have been able to appreciate as a complex situation before you came, but now you can more systematically and analytically understand it. One of those very simple ways is to look behind the language um, and look at, uh, and, and don't just gloss over the language. Uh, what is meant, for example, in this case, value creation is, is a classic example. Creating value is a business term. One of the hallmarks of new public management is to say that government should be more efficient. And thus, if government were run more like a, a private sector organization, uh, then it would be more efficient and more responsive to, quote, customer needs. So the adoption of public sector principles uh, began to be quite popular. Uh, maximizing return on investment is a kind of language you would expect uh, to use. Is education an investment? Is infrastructure an investment? Does government only spend money for things that are investment? What is an investment? An investment is I guess conceptually something you would expect to be able to extract value out of at a later time. If you buy a house, you expect to get more value out of it later when you sell it. If you invest in a piece of artwork, you expect to be able to sell it uh, for uh, higher than you got it. Um, investment is not consumption. So consumption would be to consume, to enjoy something now, but we don't expect some value out of it at a later time. Well, is government's role to make strategic investments so that at some time in the future it can get more out of an asset, um, I would say that would be a highly contestable view of what government does. Uh, that reduces government's activities to a very private sector type of mindset, which is if it's not going to make money or if it's not going to end up being uh, profitable, it's not worth doing. And I think we can all agree that at least some functions of governments are not necessarily going to make money. Uh, but they are worth doing, and that, that would be a political statement, but I think one that uh, most people would agree with. Efficiency we see here, engaging customers there, we see just, just used right out in front, right? So customers um, as, as a term used to describe uh, the role of citizens. Same thing here, uh, performance management, as I said. So this is a very NPM, uh, or at least um, has vestiges of NPM style thinking. Uh, we have to measure things, measure and manage them, measure the optimization, uh, measure the outputs, um, outcome-based. So we need to focus on, on what we're actually doing. Uh, performance management of employees. So this is Taylorism. I have not gone into Taylorism, but it's a very deep and very interesting type of approach that was imported from the factory floor uh, into how we manage uh, public servants, how, uh, how we manage our, you know, quote, human resources. And uh, in this way, uh, we can reduce the things that people do to a handful of things that we can measure. And then we can see how effectively or quickly or efficiently they do them. And then we can uh, rank and yank or we can select and promote based upon those types of things. Um, outside organizations, private sector, we see mention of the private sector. We see mention of performance orientation. Once again, we see contracting and purchasing always, you know, issues of procurement, uh, procurement, uh, as an issue blossomed in the new public management era because government is contracting with and buying things from the private sector. Uh, so clearly that opened up a whole new way to look at the relationship between government and society, government and the private sector. It opened up uh, issues to, to discuss about uh, contracting, institutional, uh, or rather um, transaction costs and institutional economics, et cetera. Um, so how would the following concepts be treated differently between traditional public administration and public management? This is as, as your professor Bali has suggested that I, I might want to include a few questions. Uh, how would each of these treat the notion of efficiency? They, they both want to be efficient, okay? But uh, they approach it in slightly different ways and, and slightly different ideological uh, perspectives. How would they approach transparency or accountability? Uh, how would they approach uh, the notion of equity and fairness? So, uh, things related to um, sort of social issues. And then finally, uh, how might they approach budgeting? So I'm not going to answer those questions. I think those are things that we can save for the discussion, but certainly um, there's something that we could, uh, we could consider. As I begin to close, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the criticisms. Uh, 
course, these are criticisms that we find uh, nowadays. My colleagues and I informally talk about um, uh, neoliberalization, which is uh, um, I, a, a certain type of expression of new public management, uh, where, where you've got basically um, to, to reduce the, the, the functionality of an organization to purely its, its core elements and focus on efficiency and, and measuring and managing and metricizing. Uh, we see this in uh, higher education. I think uh, anybody who's been involved with that, and certainly my colleagues and I can uh, attest to the, uh, the managerialization of higher education as well as a public organization in many, in many countries. Um, so replacement of the public with the private is a big, is a big criticism. Uh, there are certain uh, things. The notion of the public is that things have to be fair and equal. Uh, do we have a guarantee that the private sector is always going to be fair and equal? We can create laws and institutions that oversee that, um, but uh, we generally think of the government as being um, you know, primarily driven by notions of, of fair treatment. The hollowing out of the state this term is very interesting. This is the idea that state capacity, the things that states used to do, the, the scientists who worked for the government, the analysts who worked for government, the, uh, the truck drivers who worked for government, to say local um, government agencies that would collect garbage, for example, all of, it, all of that capacity, so much of that capacity has, has been lopped off onto the private sector. And thus we sort of the notion of the state has been hollowed out, not, in, not only in terms of uh, personnel, but in terms of asset holdings uh, and, and other ways we can measure uh, the state. Uh, loss of political accountability, legitimate, uh, I believe, criticism. Um, if uh, a private company is providing, um, let's say, uh, uh, education, uh, secondary school education, for a private company is providing uh, hospitalization, et cetera, um, then uh, we lose a little bit of political control over those because our private companies are able to make certain decisions um, and, so, and have certain preferences in many cases that uh, the public organizations uh, might not be able to make. That is even uh, discriminatory decisions. If we look at the provision of home loans, for example, we see a long history in the United States of discriminatory patterns in home loans uh, across racial lines, right? So private banks uh, would not loan to non-white lend uh, borrowers, for example, uh, in, you know, for uh, a long time. And, and arguably, I imagine there's probably some discrimination even today. Um, additionally, we would see, uh, you know, the loss of political accountability unless the government were making provisions for that. And the government does. The government has a uh, home loan program uh, in an attempt to try to, uh, the government of the United States does, an attempt to try to make up for that loss of political responsiveness or accountability uh, in a certain service. Uh, profit motive, if we're providing public goods, should companies make profit from providing public goods? Should a company make a profit from providing an education, from providing for public health, for providing for police protection, for providing for military protection? Is the military someplace that we should view as, as a profit opportunity? Um, we see privatization of military in various ways uh, for quite some time. And, uh, and of course, the U.S., uh, involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan has featured the use of private organizations in many cases, Halliburton, Blackwater, et cetera, uh, organizations that also did not have as much political accountability as well and got themselves into some significant uh, trouble. Uh, there are cases on that that I won't be able to get into, but those are interesting examples. Um, and so we talk about uh, this, I just included this because I, I like this title here, uh, a, an article by Irvine uh, Lapsley. Um, new public management, the cruelest invention of the human spirit. That's a very clever title. I have to uh, give some credit to that. Um, but again, the idea that it, it, it just sort of reduces, it, it removes the soul, it reduces everything um, to sort of this sort of market ethic. Um, and the notion of citizenship, the notion of, of community, the notion of, of um, sacrifice, you know, that citizenship comes with sacrifice in some ways. Um, that, that we live in a system, in a society uh, where we have to consider other people, the existence of other people. And, uh, and if we really reduce um, uh, what we think of as a society as just purely a bunch of individual people fighting it out in a brutal system uh, as modeled by game theory or decision theory um, or uh, you know, rational choice, uh, then, then we're all just basically... Uh, uh, utility maximizing automatons, 
and uh, and where's the sense of community? Uh, so it's a very interesting argument uh, to make. Uh, from an academic side, uh, NPM or post NPM NPM critiques have come primarily from Anglo-American contexts. Um, we have to consider also that what we understand as NPM has, has been interpreted in many different ways uh, across geographies. Uh, so we have to be careful when we make blanket statements about NPM. It's been done partially in some places or, or it's been indigenized, so to speak, uh, in some places. Uh, so it shows a lot of different faces. Um, and finally, just talking about uh, uh, tra trajectories of public management reform. This is a good overview article here from Paula and Rupert talking about themes since the 2000s. So what came later? What came after new public management? This kind of whole of government approach. This is a very interesting um, a topic we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, the rise of technology, government technology and e-government, um, the, the notion of networking partnerships and joined up governance, et cetera. Um, obviously, open and openness and transparency has been consistent across the years. Um, and then sort of repoliticizing um, public, uh, repoliticizing public sector um, delivery. Uh, is there a new emerging model? No, there are many different models. And as a final question, I might say, what would you anticipate the reaction uh, paradigms to look like? Uh, so we talked about how NPM was a natural reaction to a, a traditional public administration that had gotten very powerful and very monopolistic in certain fields. Uh, and in, in some cases, legitimately inefficient. Uh, so um, we could have predicted that um, there would be a reaction saying, let's walk back this government issue. Let's, let's walk back this government approach. Well, uh, post NPM, what would you guess? What would you guess would be the reaction to new public management? Um, you know, would it be to, to go back to government? Would it be some third way? Uh, what would that look like? Well, a lot of scholars have attempted to look at that. Um, the notion of po post new public management uh, has been used for quite some time. This is from a 2018 article. Again, thank you, uh, Leslie Powell for referring uh, me to these. Um, and uh, we see the rise in post-NPM uh, terminology in academic publications. Uh, the reason post-NPM is used because there's not a single, uh, a single paradigm emerging. There are many different paradigms that are emerging that can be considered post-new public management. Um, some scholars want to try to uh, illustrate that there is a cohesion in uh, this post-NPM ideal organization and governance, relationship between political and admin sphere. So we're repoliticizing, uh, once again, uh, public services. Uh, the redefining of the relationship of public administration uh, in, in regards uh, to citizens versus clients, um, and then the way we assess performance. Um, we could look at uh, organizational reform in your own agencies, uh, vertical and horizontal. Um, we we re-centralize in certain ways. Um, as, a, as an exercise in repoliticizing uh, political accountability. Uh, we can uh, integrate functionally on a horizontal scale. Um, and uh, this is in response to what we call the fragmentation. What is fragmentation? This is a term that often shows up. Uh, this is uh, to take the variety of different functions uh, that were once uh, delivered by the public service, by, by governments, uh, and, and contracting them out public sector uh, goes to the private sector or goes to the third sector or the nonprofit sector. Uh, so um, you have all of these different organizations, all of these different models uh, working and trying to supply uh, basic uh, uh, government uh, products and, and government services to those who need them. Um, so whole of government has kind of returned a little bit as something that, uh, that we could consider is maybe an overarching theme, um, political accountability re-emerging as part of this reaction to uh, post new public, as part of the reaction to new public management as a post new public management uh, paradigm, um, sensitivity to political issues itself. Uh, as I said, joined up government networking and partnership. Um, so that is a way to try to try to bring a little bit of political accountability into structures that are not necessarily within the government itself, but involve uh, other, other providers, um, transparency and openness, et cetera. So these are all quite interesting. A couple of the new models that we see, new public governance, new public service. Um, so there are some scholars out there who are trying to develop uh, or and have already developed 
um, a sort of set of principles for how we might move forward after new public management? How do we repair the relationship between uh, society and the government, uh, state society, if you believe it's in need of repair? Uh, how do we bring more accountability back while maintaining efficiency? Does the pendulum sort of settle in the middle um, or does it swing all the way back to the other side? The last couple of slides here are just efforts uh, made by uh, scholars to compare. Uh, so just as, as a total conclusion to this uh, lecture today, um, this is a, a very interesting, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we see old public administration or traditional public administration. We see new public management, and then we see new public service as representative of a post new public management paradigm. We could talk about the role, this is very popular role of government, rowing, steering, and serving. Um, rowing is the government doing things. Steering is the government uh, directing other non-government entities to do things. Uh, so think about, uh, you know, steering at the back of a boat while everybody else rows, if you do dragon boat, for example, uh, and then serving, right? So completely removing yourself from that paradigm and saying, okay, well, how do we best serve the interests of people? This is the final slide. Uh, this is from Ora On Pucheron, who is the uh, founding dean of the School of Public Policy at Chiang Mai University, writing in an article um, and uh, talking about um, also comparing a few more, in fact, across different elements. So ancient public administration, as I mentioned, traditional public administration, NPM, um, new public governance, uh, which was the, and then uh, what she says is very interesting. So with the final slide, I'm, I'm leading you or encouraging you to think even further now, what's gonna happen in the 2020s and 2030s at the time when you all uh, have graduated and you're, you're at the peak of your careers, um, you're, in, you're influential, you're climbing the ladder, you're trying to make a, a difference and trying to uh, bring your own uh, values and perspectives to, to public organizations, to public sector reform. What does it look like? Uh, impossible for us to know, of course, but smart, sustainable, these are buzzwords, as you well know. I write a lot about smart cities. I write some about sustainability. Um, and uh, are these simply, is smart simply about technology? Is sustainability simply only about the environment? Well, no. These uh, narratives are being folded into uh, broader ideals about participation, and democratization, and equality, uh, et cetera. So um, it's a very interesting space to watch, I think. And I think you're in a unique position being at the Crawford School uh, to have access to the best thinkers on these issues. In, in a country, Australia, that is, uh, is quick to change its governance paradigms in some ways and, uh, and has been a really interesting case study uh, and a lot of what I've talked about today. So I think that um, uh, I really look forward to talking with you all. I think you have, uh, based upon your experiences, some really interesting things to share. I wanna learn more from you. What I've hoped to do today is to provide a very high level overview. I mean, it's impossible to do in one lecture, but we could have spent the entire semester just talking about the evolution of, of the practice of public administration. Uh, and the theories that underlie that. But I've given you, I've tried to give you a, a very brief crash course in that, um, just to throw out some terminology and throw out some ideas that'll hopefully get your mind going. Uh, at the end of the day, I just hope you can relate this to uh, some of the work that you're doing. Um, I hope it uh, is uh, understandable and clear in the sense that you can take it back to what you're doing. Uh, and um, since you're going to be the ones who inherit public services and public organizations, uh, as you advance in your career, um, I would say uh, be aware of the past, be aware of how these ideas have developed, be aware of how your own ideas are developing based upon your own context, what you experience, what you observe. And, um, and of course, in a normative sense, uh, just speaking uh, personally, I, I implore you to uh, pay attention to uh, the, the responsibility of the government to serve the people and, and to create uh, the best life possible for every last person. Uh, and, uh, and I strongly believe in that. And I think that's a view shared by many of, and most of my colleagues as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the time you have spent to, um, to observe this uh, interesting lecture, I think. Uh, and I hope I've made it as interesting as possible. And I look forward to speaking with you uh, later on this week. Uh, thank you very much, and, uh, and please be in touch with me also. You saw my contact information at the, at the first slide. Um, any, any offline conversations you want to have, 
uh, or, or um, conversations that you want to begin um, with, with Professor Bali and, and me, I would welcome them. Uh, thank you very much. I will see you very soon and be well.